sermon text reading is found in Ezra chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sarahiah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Atitab, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Merahiah, son of Zerahiah, son of Juzi, son of Buki, son of Abishua, son of Phineas, son of Eliezer, sorry, uh, son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra, <laughs> this Ezra went up for Babylonia. He was a scribe, skilled in the law of Moses, that the Lord, the God of the Israel had given, and the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel, and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers, and the temple servants. The word of the Lord, you may be seated. You may think that I was trying to torture Dave Aldrich with that sermon text reading because I had the entire book of Ezra out of which to choose that opening introductory reading and I gave him um, Ezra's um, genealogy to read, which had a few tough names in there, not too many. But, um, uh, but really and truly, that passage is hugely important. And let me tell you why before we actually start our series. Um, that's the first place in the book of Ezra that Ezra is introduced to us. He's not introduced into the book until chapter 7 of the book. There's only 10 chapters there. And, and it starts with this fairly lengthy genealogy. But I want you to ask yourself this question because it may be a week or two before we get there. Why is that genealogy so important? So start where it starts and end where it ends. Keyword, end where it ends. And see if you can tell me anything important about Ezra uh, by the time we get to chapter 4. Uh, but it's hugely, hugely important. And uh, it's, it was not uh, my attempt, although we did get a pay raise, um, having to read that text. So we're going to, yeah, we doubled his salary. Uh, he went from zero to zero. Um, and, uh, but now he has a double zero, so it's going really well. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> anyways, we're beginning a new series this morning in the book of Ezra. And uh, some of us know a little bit about Ezra. Some of us may know a lot about Ezra. Some of us may know nothing whatsoever about Ezra. And it is a book that is, we're coming to with a purpose because this purpose began when we studied the book of Jeremiah together and then we went to Lamentations and then we went to the book of Daniel. And now we're going to the book of Ezra. And is in the book of Ezra, we're going to be led to a lot of other places as well. We'll be led back to Jeremiah. We will be led back to Daniel. We're also going to be led into the book of Haggai, and we're going to be led into the book of Zechariah, both of whom are mentioned in the book of Ezra. We could jump out of there and go to Ezekiel. And, and the last place we could go is Nehemiah because the book of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Hebrew Bible were originally one book, not two books. And it was those who canonized scripture that thought it would be easier to divide the books into two. So we'll be looking at Nehemiah as well. So you get a six book offering in 10 chapters in the book of Ezra. So we're going to be here for the rest of our lives. Just kidding, but I think that we'll be in Ezra for about six or seven weeks. I haven't quite yet 
decided. And for those of you who know how I do what I do, I'll explain it again in case you don't know. I generally give an introductory talk on a new book, which is today. And then I give a concluding talk, which sort of highlights the major themes that I've chosen to look at as we've gone through a book. And we did that last week with the book of Daniel <clears throat> before we actually get to the text as hard as we will. So this morning will be about half lecture and then half sermon toward the end as I want to introduce you to two of the themes that I think that Ezra highlights more than anything else. And so that is where I think we're going, and I hope that I can bring you with us along the way. As I mentioned by way of introduction, the first six chapters of the book of Ezra do not mention Ezra at all. And here's the big secret as to why. They are historical chapters that are written about the period prior to the time when Ezra was born. So Ezra is not mentioned at all. Ezra shows up in chapter 7, and the question becomes, why is the book named after him if he's only in four of the ten chapters in the entire book? What is so important about this guy that a book of the Bible would be mentioned about him when half the book doesn't even speak about him. And quite honestly, the t period of time when he is in the book, he's strictly giving the people prophecy that's been given to him by God to the people. So, so why is he so important? And that genealogy that we read or David read for us, we'll answer that question when we get there. But the question is uh, often raised, and I try to answer it as best I can. Who wrote the book of the Bible that we're looking at? And so I'm going to give you three possibilities. All three of these possibilities are orthodox. You will not go to hell for believing any one of the three. I am not saying that it is unimportant, but it, this is one of those books where the meaning of the text doesn't change dramatically depending on where you land. You could say Ezra wrote the entire book, and there is not a major problem with that, except for the challenge of trying to explain why he know, knew so much about the history which preceded his life. It could well have been that he was a excellent student of history, uh, but most scholars kind of poo-poo the idea that Ezra wrote the entire book. But it's really not a problem. If you choose to land there, I can give you scholarly arguments for or against it, but most conservative scholars do not land there. Most conservative scholars land in the next two options available to you. There is an anonymous individual who wrote the first and second chronicles, which is a book that was written in and around the same time as the book of Ezra. And the second view is that uh, Ezra wrote part of the book, and that section of the book would have been <clears throat> the section in the middle, which is written in the first person. And then the first six chapters were written by the fellow or lady that wrote the book of Chronicles, and that the last two chapters uh, were written by the chronicler as well. Uh, no problem with that point of view. The third point of view is simply that the chronicler wrote all of it. Along with First and Second Chronicles, he wrote the book of Ezra. Um, Take your pick. I don't think it has dramatic theological significant changes. The only answers that you have to come up with is part of the book is in the first person, part of the book is in the third person, and part of the book is history that predates the person of Ezra. And so that's the challenge with trying to figure out who it was that wrote the book of Ezra. Now, here's another interesting fact about Ezra, and I really am going to be controversial here. The book of Ezra, according to scholars, is never directly quoted in the New Testament. And if you grew up in a context like I grew up, that means it is a Second 
top-tier book. It is not as important as the book of Romans. It's not as important as the Gospel of John. It is not as important as the book of Revelation because it's number one from the Old Testament and number two, not quoted in the New Testament. So its only value is in giving us historical background and in historical information. You can study it if you want on your own time, but it will not be preached from this pulpit. Now, let me tell you what I think about that. <laughs> this book already has drawn me to believe some and extraordinary things about the Lord Jesus. It is unbelievable, even though it is challenging. It's only 10 chapters long. If you like names and numbers, look at chapter 2. That whole chapter is nothing but names and numbers. David read to us from chapter 7, a long genealogy. There are other genealogies in the book of Ezra. Dave, how is it possible that you can make this interesting and germane to 2021? I promise you, if I do my job remotely well, you will find it as contemporary as any other book of the Bible. It was written for 2021. And I hope to give you some hints this morning as to why I think that just because it is not directly quoted in the New Testament that it is extraordinarily important and all the rest of it. The reason we're doing it is because it follows right along after the book of Daniel. And so I'm going to give you the historical context and the backdrop and read through just a little bit of that so you can see the historical setting and why it's important and why we're doing this book at this point. In, in 539 BC, now all of you are experts and students on ancient Babylonian and Judean history, having gone through Jeremiah, Lamentations, and Daniel now. So all these dates you would ace on the exam you'll have at the end of the book of Ezra. 539 BC, Cyrus, king of Persia, conquers Babylon. Daniel is a prophet in Babylon at the time, but the Persians take over. The Judean exiles have been in exile in Babylon for 70 years. Daniel had his faithful friends, uh, many beyond the three, have been waiting for exile to end and for God's promises found in Jeremiah to be revealed and for the people to be able to return to their own land. Cyrus is the guy who is going to accomplish this. A year following in 538 BC, Cyrus wrote one of his four major decrees and in 538 he wrote a decree about the exiles being able to return from Babylon to Judea, back to Jerusalem, back to the capital city. A journey of 950 to 1,000 miles sounds great. If you were one of the faithful few, you've been looking forward to this day for a very long time. I'm going to say this again, but I want to say it now because I want you to have this in your mind over and over again. Babylon, by now, was home. It was comfortable. You have married there. You have had your children there. You have established families, businesses. Your livelihood and your future were all based in Babylon. Babylon at this point, and Cyrus in particular, was a land of religious and political tolerance. You didn't have a problem being a Jew in Babylon at the time. And if you had been there from Daniel's age, it was really and truly all that you knew. And so leaving Babylon posed more challenges than it did to stay. So the only people that left Babylon were people who left for a vastly different reason. They didn't leave for comfort. They didn't leave because they wanted their land back because 
they never had land. They'd been in Babylon for 70 years. Daddy or granddaddy may have had land, but I don't have anything to re-inherit. And to go back meant to go back to a city and to a nation which had first of all been decimated by Nebuchadnezzar the king and had not been touched in 70 years. So to go back there meant nothing but dirty fingernails, sweat, and hard work. So it's very important for us as we come to Ezra that we don't have this idea that it was, you know, skipping and shouting and dancing on your way back to the magic kingdom where the streets were paved with gold and apples and figs and dates were falling from the trees because there was nothing there. But that's what was happening in 538 B.C. And the only people who were looking forward to the return of exile were freaks. Religious zealots like us who believed the promises of God and believed that what God promises over there is better than that what the world I live in shows me. Uh, You see the tension? God said that's better over there. But what's over there is desolation, hard work, sweat and toil, leaving my family behind. But what is here, I can have a part of improving. I can have a future. I have security. That's the choice that is faced in Ezra. And it is a very, very, very big choice. So a year later in 537, under a guy whose name is Shelzbazar, whose name will come up in the book of Ezra, the first group of exiles return to back to the land of Israel and to the city of Jerusalem. And guess what they do when they get to Jerusalem? The first thing that they do is in 537, they go back to the place where the temple had been destroyed and they rebuilt the altar of God. The foundations are begun to be laid, but they rebuild the altar. And we'll get to why that is so important. The next year, the temple begins to be rebuilt. And then the following year after that, beginning in chapter 4 of the book, but in 536 B.C., guess what happens? Opposition shows up. There are cranky people who are still living in the land who don't like the fact that Israel is rebuilding the temple. And there's this long stretch in chapter 4 about the opposition that comes to this. And the tattletales go back up to Persia and say, you should know what these guys are doing, you should put a stop to it. And that's a very fascinating section that we'll spend some time in in depth. And the people become discouraged. And there's a 20-year delay in the rebuilding of the temple and putting the nation back in order. And then these two wild-haired prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, show up and start throwing the Bible around by way of God's word and say, get your act together and do what God tells you to do. And then the temple is rebuilt and dedicated in 516. And, and then Ezra begins his role as correcting the people as priest and scribe. So that's kind of the historical backdrop. Um, It's over a fairly long period of time, you know, kind of 30, 40 years is the time period of Ezra, following immediately after the Persians took over Babylon, and Cyrus gives the decree for the people to go home. But I wanted you to have this sense and this feeling of why they're going home and what they're doing. Now, that's the historical backdrop. I'm not going to say anything about Ezra today because you're going to study with diligence his genealogy and tell me why he is so important. Key, and I'll give you the hint right now, and you can all get your PhDs, there's one name in that genealogy that will tell you all you need to know about why Ezra is important. Okay, so that may be of help to you, and feel free to, uh, there's like maybe prizes for getting this. 
The gist of it is, is the people want to go home. Some of the people want to go home and they want to rebuild the temple of God. And so with that in mind, I want to highlight two words for us and tell you why they're important. And I should have done this long ago, but this is an excellent place to do it. I want to talk a little bit about the word temple and why it is important because it is so central to the book of Ezra. And I want to talk about the word exile and why it is so important and why it is a major theme in the book of uh, Ezra. The word temple, I'll be really honest with you, we could take the next seven weeks and I could talk just about the word temple and you would never be bored and I would not exhaust everything there is to say about the temple of the Lord in the Bible. The problem that I have, and this is why I'm going to speak about it, is that when I hear the word temple, it doesn't mean what it should mean to me. I don't have a biblical understanding of the word temple, and it doesn't hit me as important as it should. The word temple obviously began with the word tabernacle. Israel has had three great exiles, the exile in Egypt, the exile in Assyria, now the exile in Babylon. When the people of Israel came out of the exile that would lasted 400 years from the Egyptians, what did they do? They wandered around in the desert. And God gave very specific instructions to them. And he told the people of Israel, if you want to meet me, You will meet me on my terms, at my place, and you will do what I want you to do exactly the way I want you to do it at the time I pick, at the place I pick, and it will look the way I show you for it to look. And so a great deal of that section in Exodus and Deuteronomy are pictures of what the tabernacle should look like. The difference between the tabernacle and the temple is the tabernacle moved with the people. The temple was a stationary place built in Jerusalem when Solomon was king, but they accomplished the same goals. They did the same things, and they were built with the instruction of God given to the people. I want this kind of fabric, I want this kind of wood, I want this amount of gold, I want this amount of silver, this is how the priests are to act and respond, and so on and so forth. The tabernacle or the temple, in either case, was the place that represented the presence of God among his people. God dwelt there. If you were near the tabernacle, if you were in the temple, you were where God resided, at least figuratively and universally, the tabernacle and the temple. But beyond that, and this is really important, it was the place where sacrifice was offered for sin. Now, it was temporary and you had to do it all the time, but it was the place where relationship could be established between you and God, where the problem of sin could be dealt with so that God could stand to be around you. And so God says, it'll be at my time, in my place, it'll look this way, and you will do it exactly the way I want you to do this. And he's very specific about this, and he says a tremendous amount about it in the Old Testament. I want to give you just two examples, and there are things that are important for us to understand. Leviticus 17, and this is talking about the tabernacle, but let me read verses 2 through 4. God is speaking to Moses, and he says, speak to Aaron and his sons. By the way, that may be a key name in that little genealogy. Hint, hint, hint. Moses speaking to Aaron from God, the first high priest, okay? Very important. Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel and say to them, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. If any one of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp 
or kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to, the, to offer it as a gift to the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guilt shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood and that man shall be cut off from among the people. Lots of words. Here's the gist of it. You try to offer a sacrifice any place other than where God has said to offer it. You are to be cut off and the blood guiltiness of your sin rests on you forever. Don't mess around with where you offer sacrifice. Now this becomes hugely important in the book of Ezra. I promise you. If you can remember that one point, it'll be really, really important. Let me give you one more example from Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and to make his habitation there. And there you shall go. And there you will bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your contributions, that you present your vow offerings and your free will offerings and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice and you and your households in all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You want to worship me rightly you come to my place is the point okay huge message in the old testament you didn't go down to 7-eleven you didn't go up to that hill you didn't go to that hill you went where god told you to offer sacrifices the ethiopian eunuch in the desert who comes to faith with philip is coming from the temple on his way back to Ethiopia because that was the place you took care of business. The temple is the presence of God and it is the place where the problem of sin is dealt with. And Israel hasn't been there for 70 years. The problem of sin cannot be taken care of. Can you imagine why Daniel longed for the end of the exile? And can you imagine why his visions and his dreams were so horrifying to him? Because his visions and dreams given to him by God were pictures of the temple which was going to be rebuilt and yet desecrated again. And then rebuilt and ultimately destroyed in 70 AD. Daniel wanted the presence of God permanently. He wanted the problem of sin to be dealt with once for all. But when he saw the future, God showed him visions of the temple being desecrated over and over again. Antiochus Epiphanes, the Roman Empire, all these people who were going to destroy and desecrate the temple yet again. Do you imagine? Can you see why Daniel was sick? Because the temple was the place of the living God where the problem of sin was dealt with. But when he got a glimpse of the future, it didn't appear to be permanent. It appeared as if human history could have something to do with the presence of God and the doing away with sin. And this was terribly disturbing. But it does give us the reason why when the exiles came back to Jerusalem, the first thing they did was build the altar. Because the thing they longed for more than anything else was sin to be forgiven and relationship with God to be restored. All barriers between them and God to be removed and you needed an altar and you needed a sacrifice for that. That was more important than the walls of the building and the walls around the city you needed the altar. 
That's why the temple is central to the book of Ezra. It's hugely important. And they've lived without it for so long. I mean, can you imagine knowing that you were a sinner? Knowing that there is a way for that sin to be dealt with, but you can't do anything about it because you're a thousand miles away? And you having to raise your children and tell them? Try to be good today, Johnny, because we can't do anything about your sin. You're going to have to wait 50 years to where a sacrifice can be offered for you. And the importance of the word exile. What does exile mean? Exile means separation. Removal from your place. In Assyria, the people were removed, the northern tribes, because of their disobedience for sure. But any possibility with relationship with God is removed in exile. When Judah was taken into captivity in Babylon, they became exiles. And that relationship between them and God had a wall between them. Because the place they needed to be, they couldn't be. That's what it means to be an exile. An alien and a stranger in a foreign land, unable to be where you want to be, where you have perfect union with God. And that's exactly how the New Testament describes us, believers, exiles, aliens, and strangers. And here's the big difference, and this is two of the punchlines of the book of Ezra, and they are absolutely glorious. Jesus tells the Pharisees, I will tear down this temple and in three days it will be rebuilt. The book of Hebrews calls the Lord Jesus our high priest. Jesus himself says, I am the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I am am the sacrifice. And the whole book of Ezra points to this. And the Jewish mind doesn't need to have it quoted because they get it. What does man need? He needs a perfect sacrifice in a perfect place. Exactly the way God orchestrated it. And told everybody what it should look like. And you know what? It had three crosses on a little hill. And in the middle was the Son of God. And he said, I am the temple and I am the sacrifice. And I am the high priest. And you get to God through me. And the whole book of Ezra points to this. But but here are the fascinating challenges. And I'm really being sincere when I say this. Do I want Jesus as bad as the exiles wanted to go back to Jerusalem? You know what I'm saying? Do, Do I cherish what he has done for me nearly as much as those people did to give up all their comfort in Babylon and come back to Jerusalem so that they could have relationship with God through Christ. They earned nothing. Don't misunderstand me. And we earn nothing. But do I cherish the sacrifice of Christ that much. 
And here's the other challenge that I face on a real daily basis. And I know this is so churchy. And I know that they're just words. I do see this world as home, if I'm blatantly honest. And I work to make this home better. And I care more about getting this place squared away and I forget I'm an exile. I forget this isn't home. And consequently, I don't believe that what God promises is better than I can make this place. I mean, I'm just being honest. I really don't think that what God has promised is better than I can make this place. And I'm wrong. And I'm wrong. Because it's there that he has promised himself and he has already proven it by giving me entrance there through what his son has done. So I don't need a sacrifice. And this is what Ezra is about. Can you believe that? It just, it blows my mind how much I love this putrid place. I never would have left Babylon. I mean, if the truth be told, I probably would have been one of those guys that stayed there. I really would love to think I wouldn't be but I probably was because I valued that more than putting my relationship right with God in his place. And that shames me. That shames me. So, I'm pretty excited because this got twists and turns And it put the rubber to the road this week for me. So let's pray. Father, may your word open our eyes to how glorious our future is. And may we long for what is promised rather than what is here. Because what is unseen is real. And this is the fantasy. This is the lie. This is the deception. What is to come is what is real. And may we long more for relationship with you than anything else. Because Christ has done it all. And it is in his name we pray. Amen.